Welcome to NHK Newsline. I'm Gino Tani in Tokyo. U.S. defense officials warned that North Korea may conduct long-range ballistic missile tests over the next year. The Defense Intelligence Agency released a report that examined the current situation of North Korea's military power on Friday. It says Pyongyang will work to improve its new solid-fuel ballistic missiles, which can be prepared for launch more quickly than the liquefied fuel or the liquid-fueled ones. The report also notes integrating a nuclear weapon with a ballistic missile is North Korea's ultimate goal. It notes that further underground tests to validate nuclear weapon capabilities are possible. Pyongyang announced a unilateral nuclear and ICBM testing moratorium in 2018 ahead of the historic first summit with the United States. But in January, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un announced plans to step up the country's nuclear and missile development programs. The North has launched a series of new missiles in recent months. People in Malta have held memorials for an investigative journalist who was killed there four years ago. Daphne Caruana Galicia was killed in a car bombing in 2017. The 53-year-old had been reporting on issues such as political corruption for 30 years. She wrote about alleged financial misconduct by a relative of former Maltese Prime Minister Joseph Muscat. The local residents on Saturday gathered at the murder site and applauded to honor the late journalist at the time the bomb went off four years ago. Members of an international organization to protect press freedom joined a memorial rally in the capital, Valletta. Critical journalists play such an important role in our society. When they investigate and publish, they bring information to our attention. The protection of this is such an important part of Daphne's legacy. A man was found guilty of planting the bomb and sentenced to prison in a trial this year. But it is not known who ordered the murder or for what purpose. The International Olympic Committee has welcomed positive feedback from athletes about test events for next year's games in Beijing. The IOC held an executive board meeting on Saturday in Athens, Greece. They talked about the ongoing test competitions in China. More than 2,000 athletes and team officials from China and other countries are taking part in the events being held at Olympic venues till late December. IOC Sports Director Kit McConnell said after the meeting, the events are being held under strict anti-COVID measures. It's really pleasing to see the feedback we've had from the international athletes and the feedback we've had is, is unanimously uh, positive regarding the venue itself, the sliding centre, but also the organisation around the Games and their, their excitement as they build up to participating in Beijing 2022. Games organisers have decided that only spectators from China's mainland will be allowed at events and participants will be permitted to travel only between their accommodations and Olympic venues. All games-related personnel will also be required to get tested daily. The 2022 Winter Games kick off next February. <music> Myanmar's military is slamming the Association of Southeast Asian Nations for excluding its leader from the bloc's upcoming summit. The association held an emergency foreign ministers meeting on Friday. The participants discussed Myanmar's involvement in the approaching talks. They decided Senior General Ming Ong Lang would not be invited to attend. The summit is scheduled to start on October 26th. ASEAN cited the military's behavior as a reason for the decision. The association has been trying to mediate between the military and pro-democracy forces in Myanmar, but it says the military has not cooperated. The bloc appointed Brunei's second foreign minister as a special envoy. He was tasked with conducting mediations between the two sides, 
but he has not been able to visit the country. Two months have passed since he assumed the role. The military has refused to allow him to meet leaders of the pro-democracy forces, such as ousted state councilor Aung San Suu Kyi. The military responded to the decision by issuing a press release on Saturday. It claims in the release that it cooperated and coordinated with the special envoy to materialize his very first trip to Myanmar. The press release also says the decision at Friday's meeting was made even though a consensus had not been reached. This is something the military says is against ASEAN principles. People in Afghanistan are struggling to get enough food to eat. This comes as economic confusion continues to reign in the wake of the Taliban's takeover. The country's economic situation has deteriorated sharply since the Taliban took control in August. The Afghan government's overseas assets have been frozen. That has resulted in a shortage of cash. Many workers have not been paid. Some have lost their jobs. Shortage of food have become even worse this year because of a drought. And humanitarian aid has stalled as countries are waiting to see how the Taliban will govern. The United Nations World Food Program says about half the children under the age of five could be suffering from hunger by the year's end. It also says as many as one million of them could die. A WFP representative says the crisis is escalating to a level that has not been seen before. We hope to reach 14 million people before the end of the year. But to be able to do that, we urgently require funding. Uh, we need $100 million to be able to do that before, uh, as the winter approaches. Some transportation routes for relief supplies will be covered with snow and impassable during the winter. WFP officials say that's why they need to deliver aid as soon as possible. Researchers conducting a large-scale experiment in Japan have managed to obtain high-purity hydrogen from water by using a photocatalytic substance. Multiple academic institutions, organizations, and companies were involved in the experiment. The New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, the University of Tokyo, and Shinshu University are among them. The researchers extracted hydrogen from water by using a 100 square meter array of solar panel reactors by applying a photocatalytic substance. The members of the research group say they safely recovered more than 70% of the generated hydrogen at a purity of 94%. They say this is the first time hydrogen has been collected from water using a panel array measuring 100 square meters. A photocatalytic causes water to split into hydrogen and oxygen by absorbing sunlight. Fossil fuels emit carbon dioxide when burned. Hydrogen does not. The gas is apparently needed to bring about a carbon-free world. This method can be used to produce large amounts of hydrogen at a low cost. We want to put the technology into practical use as soon as possible, so that large amounts of the gas can be supplied at low prices. The researchers say developing a new substance that can recover hydrogen more efficiently will make the technology practical. Those were the main stories for this hour. the news this hour. I'm Gene Otani. For all of us here at NHK Newsline, thanks very much for joining us.
Japan. Friends around, friends around the world. Thank you for tuning in to Friends Around the World. I'm Eriko Kojima. And I'm Marcellus Neely, broadcasting from Tokyo. Today we bring you part two of a two-part interview with our special guest, Professor Takako Hikotani, who is a former professor at Columbia University and currently teaches at Gakushuin University International Center. In our last show, Professor Hikotani talked about her experiences on campus in New York City during the most difficult times of the pandemic. And today she will share with us what her takeaway was from her experience and how she plans to adapt it in her current work here in Japan. So do stay with us for the next 10 minutes. So, Takako, it's such a pleasure to have you with us again today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, you know, in our last show, you told us about some of the hardships you faced as an educator because of the pandemic. Have there been any benefits to higher education that you've noticed as a result of the pandemic? Yes, um, remote teaching made distance less relevant and possibly expanded access to higher education for those who are unable to come to campus either physically, politically, or, or for economic reasons. Of course, universities need to figure out how to come up with a business model for universities that is potentially more inclusive in nature while charging for its exclusive access. Still, I tend to believe that the possibility of enhanced access is a good thing for education overall. I'm actually happy about that outcome. Education equity is becoming more of a reality. Do you think the shift to online lessons will continue on to the future? Well, not necessarily. Somewhat ironically, I believe people came to realize the importance of the community aspect of the campus experience. As professors, we had of course known that we or our classes are only a tiny part of the college experience. But even within our classes, I think many professors are coming to realize more the value of having students in the same room, not the Zoom room. Zoom is inclusive in its own ways, but all interaction tends to be very intentional. Classroom interaction tends to be more spontaneous and somewhat haphazard, but that's how causes should be. In other words, COVID deprives us of the serendipity or the serendipitous moment, probably not just on campus, but in the society more generally. You know, I actually could not agree with you more. My experience on Zoom has been a great feeling of distance between me and the people that I'm interacting with. Uh, do you think there's any difference in how the pandemic has affected Japanese and American universities or universities in other countries? Yes, um, I'm not sure about other countries, but it's true that um, not all but many universities in the U.S. are residential. Most universities in Japan are not residential. So Japanese universities did not have to worry as much about keeping students safe on campus, but had a different challenge, which was how to keep commuting students safe. Another difference from my experience at Columbia is that the proportion of international students were quite high, and making sure international students stay healthy and safe became more of an immediate issue for the school, possibly more so than colleges here. I would not say things were more difficult in the U.S. overall, but I think the challenges were quite different. Finally, because tuition for universities is so much higher in the U.S. compared to Japan, for instance, Columbia's yearly tuition is more than $60,000, and this doesn't include the award, Maybe people tend to be more sensitive to the price tag than in the case of Japan. Wow, $60,000. With that kind of tuition comes a lot of expectations, I'm sure. But how do you think these experiences will impact your new job here in Japan? Um, yes, so my current job at Luxury has to do with three things. One is to encourage students to study abroad. Two is to conclude new exchange arrangements in U.S. universities, and three to teach the students directly. The first two um, inspire students to study abroad, and two to come up with new exchange arrangements. At least in the short term, could be a little bit challenging due to COVID. Um, everybody has a somewhat of a smaller comfort zone these days, so it's very hard to encourage students to study abroad. I think that's true for U.S. universities as well. But I do think that there's a lot of things that the current generation of college students actually have in common 
But there's a lot of benefit of traveling abroad to a different country and to share that experience and talk about the experience with people in the same generation. So I'm hoping that although the travel restrictions are very difficult these days, that we would be able to work out an agreement to have more student exchange across between U.S. and Japan and between Dr. and other schools in the U.S. Um, the teaching part, I think, is overall, the COVID experience has been a general plus. There's a term called COIL, or Collaborative Online International Learning. Um, it is an effort to connect students and professors in different countries for collaborative projects and discussions. The idea itself has been around for quite a while, but um, since 2019, Ministry of Education in Japan has supported Japanese universities' efforts to adopt this model of teaching. But I think it's a lot more relevant and easier today because everybody experienced online mode of teaching, and it doesn't take that much effort beyond that to try to make that more international. The third part of my job, the teaching part, to encourage students to be more open-minded and more international-minded, that would become easier because of the technologies that developed during COVID, and that it's much easier to connect the students directly to students in other countries through that. Uh, thank you very much for all of that description. I think it was absolutely fascinating. And although you said it's been around for a while, the thing that I'm most fascinated by is this COIL program that you mentioned. Even now here in Japan, before the COVID-19 pandemic, universities had been searching for new ways to get Japanese students to experience study overseas and as part of your job now involves, and so you must know this, is that, uh, yeah, there's a momentum moving forward for that. So from my perspective, having this information about COIL and listening to your talk really did give me a lot of ideas on how to move forward with this in the future. So for that, I am absolutely grateful that you came on the show today. Um, thanks for saying that. I do think it's fascinating, both of us as college professors, that it's much easier to reach out to students around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I had a chance to teach a, a series of classes in, for Chinese students in Beijing and also students in Brazil. And that, as an educator, was a fascinating experience. And I do hope that we can both continue doing that and sort of expand our own jobs in a way, too. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, finally, I think that... Um, I thought a lot about the role of universities in society during COVID. Mm -hmm. I do think that the most important aspect of it is that it's an infrastructure for the future generation. Mm -hmm. And I think what came out of COVID is that I think universities in general are more resilient and more creative about what they do. And I'm hoping that this resilience that's being the infrastructure of the future of the universities now, both in the U.S. and Japan, is a good thing for the future generation. And due to this experience, the mutual experience or worldwide experience, um, the higher education will be more connected around the world and more accessible to more students. So I'm very happy about that part if there's any silver lining to what we just all experienced. Well, you know that expression, right? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And COVID-19 certainly has given us an opportunity to test that idea and, as you said, to discover some really great things as a result of it. Uh, once again, thank you very much for coming on the show today. It was an absolute pleasure. Yes, it really was great to have you with us, Takako. Thank you so much for having me. World Japan's radio programs are available on our free app. Yes, they are, so please visit our website for details. The URL is nhk.jp slash rj. We've been bringing you NHK World Japan Friends Around the World from Tokyo. But it's time to say goodbye. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed our show. I'm Eriko Kojima. And I'm Marcellus Neely. Until next time, sayonara. sayonara.
It's time for Easy Japanese from NHK World Japan. I'm Mary Kokojima. And I'm Michael Reese. Let's have fun learning Japanese together. Today we bring you Lesson 27 on Asking About Choices. Tam, a student from Vietnam, goes to a famous ramen shop in Tokyo. Kaito, one of her housemates, took her here. At the restaurant, Tam has a flashback about Yuki, a Japanese music student she admires. She met him in Vietnam, where they were doing volunteer work together. Listen to the skit for Lesson 27. Goodbye. Tam-san, what do you do? Which is the most delicious? It's a miso ramen. It's a miso ramen. Okay, let's go over the skit line by line. The waiter speaks to Kaito and Tam. What would you like? Kaito asks, Tam, what do you want? Tam doesn't know what to choose. So she asks, Which one is the most tasty? Kaito answers, I recommend the miso ramen. Tam mumbles, Miso ramen. Miso ramen. Tam remembers something Yuki said when they were in Vietnam. Japanese ramen is tasty. I really like it with miso. Tam recollects Yuki's words and says, I'll have the miso ramen. Well, that certainly seems to have brought back memories. Today's key phrase is, which one is the most tasty? If you study this pattern, you'll be able to ask about choosing from three or more items. Here's the key phrase. Dore means which. The ga that follows is a particle indicating that dore is the topic of this sentence. Ichiban means number one, and oishi means tasty. So, ichiban oishi would be the most tasty. Adding this ga at the end of the sentence and raising the intonation turns it into a question, remember? Now today's point. When you want to say something is the best or the most among three or more things, you use ichiban. For example, to say something is the most tasty. In front of tasty, oishi comes ichiban, and this makes ichiban oishi. If you want to ask which one is the best, you start out a sentence with dore ga ichiban. Dore is an interrogative to choose one from a number of things. So, for which one is the most tasty, you'd ask dore ga ichiban oishi desu ka? Exactly. Now, listen and repeat. Oishi desu. Ichiban oishi desu. Got it? Here's a conversation that involves making another choice. A customer is trying to select sweets at a souvenir shop. Now let's review the conversation. Which one is the most popular? means is popular. Ninki is popular and arimas is the masu form of the verb is. Aru. I recommend this one. Kore is this one. And 
おすすめ is recommended. Now your turn. Listen and repeat. 人気があります。一番人気があります。どれが一番人気がありますか Let's practice with some other qualities. You've come to a store to buy a suitcase. Ask the clerk which one is the cheapest. Cheap is. Yasui. Yasui. Dore ga ichiban yasui desu ka? Dore ga ichiban yasui desu ka? At a menu in a Japanese restaurant, it has many different course offerings. Ask which one of them is the most economical. Economical is the na adjective. Otokuna. Otokuna. When you want to use the na adjective at the end of a sentence, you replace the na with des. Remember? How did you do? Today's bonus phrase is this line by the waiter in the skit. Memorize it as a whole. Go to Mova. Go to Mova. Means, what would you like? Waiters say this when taking orders from customers. Chumo is order, and to show respect to the customer, go is attached to the front of the word. Wa at the end is a topic marker particle. The rest of the question, what would it be, is understood without being said. Listen to how various people say this phrase. Go chumo wa? Go chumo wa? Go chumo wa? Now, listen to the skit one more time. Go to Mova. Tamu san, nani ni suru? Dore ga ichiban o ishii desu ka? Miso ramen ga o susume da yo. Miso ramen. Nihon no ramen wa o ishii yo. Boku wa miso ramen ga suki nanda. 私味噌ラーメンにします。Ramen originally came from China, but it underwent some changes in Japan. And as a result, it's come to be known as one of Japan's representative foods.、Mm. Now, I like shoyu ramen, that's、mm-hmm. soy sauce ramen.、Mm-hmm. But ramen actually comes in all kinds of flavors. That's right. It can be made from various stocks, such as chicken, pork bone, and seafood. Miso bean paste, salt, soy sauce, and other ingredients add to the taste. And new flavors are constantly being developed, right? Yes. Chefs are searching for unique tastes. For example, ramen with cheese or heavy cream. Even if you stick to more conventional recipes, you can still find plenty of variations. Lots of locales have a flavor of their own, so travel around and let ramen be your guide. Sure hope you enjoyed today's easy Japanese. Join us again next time.